I thank you, Elena. And and I could just as easily be introducing Elena, saying all the very same things about Elena. <laughs> thank you, Elena. <laughs> So um, the uh, the we're going to have an auction coming up here, December sixth, uh, for the the proceeds are going to uh, go to the Cambodia project. And so I just wanted to kind of walk through some some uh, slides with you and give you a little background on it. I know most of you have seen this in previous years, so it's not going to be a lot of new information. But there are uh, there are always great things that are happening. Um, for those who didn't, you know, who haven't seen this before. Uh, Cambodia, of course, is located kind of in between Laos and Vietnam and Thailand. So it's a little quadrant there in Southeast Asia. Um, we work in the rural villages there, and we're working in the aftermath of the Khmer Rouge. I suspect everybody knows the Khmer Rouge experience uh, after the Vietnam War, uh, famine, carpet bombing, et cetera, uh, set off this uh, genocide. There was an internal genocide in which um, some two and a half to three million people perished in, in a country of 13 million. So really terrible. And the, the underpinnings of that were that the Khmer Rouge wanted to return the country back to you know, year zero. So anybody that had an education, anybody that had any exposure to Western culture at all was put to death or put into the work camps and died. Um, if you wore eyeglasses, you were put to death. Um, if you had you know, if you knew any words in a foreign language, you were put to death. So, and they relocated everybody around the country so that the peasant rice farmers who could have grown rice where they grew up were now in a different part of the country and couldn't do that. So it, the country just fell apart. Finally, the United Nations stepped in and they, they wound up, you know, rebuilding the country, creating a democracy, but you're creating a democracy from ground zero where nobody has an education, nobody knows how to do anything. So, that's kind of the environment into which we 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 walked all these displaced families in different areas of the country, nobody with an education. Um, the dry season is three, four to five months long. During that, there's you know you have to walk miles sometimes to get water. Uh, Elena took this picture in one of our early trips. Um, young boy walking miles to get water. Um, you know, uh, kids growing, uh, raising their 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 siblings, um, so not having a chance to get to uh, school to get an education, uh, a lot of malnutrition. So that's the environment in which we stepped when we tried to to help, and we wanted to help in a way that was an empowerment based model. We we didn't want to just walk in and say, oh, you know, we're going to give you everything. In fact, we initially went in with these ideas that we had picked up from Heifer International and Care International and these other organizations on you know, what we thought would be the really great way to do things. And we rapidly learned that it was a lot better to listen to the village families. They knew what they really needed. And, and in doing that, it became much more of a true empowerment project. Um, and and uh, uh, so we have just followed this model since then of having the Cambodian families be behind this and to really help them get started. Uh, in 2005 is when we really kind of kicked into gear there. Uh, we took a, a big trip over um, Tim Sorrell, uh, who does the filming for the, uh, for the Gator football team and the like, uh, came, went over and did a video with us. Uh, that's Tim with some of the kids. As part of that, Tim was uh, telling some of the locals about Rotary. Uh, and and the concept of service above self just really clicked with them. It was like a light bulb went off when the translator was saying service above self. And, and that led to their creating the Rotary Club of Posat. The Rotary Club of Posat finally, in, it was the only club in central Cambodia that had a, a Rotary Club like this. And, and so then it shows up on Rotary International's website, right? Um, so anybody that's traveling Southeast Asia decides, Rotarians decide maybe they want to go into Cambodia. As part of that, they go to the RI website and they look to see, well, is there a club in Cambodia? Well, yeah, there is. Well, that led to the, a club from uh, Perth and Western Australia visiting and then getting all of Western Australia into the organization. It led to Calgary, Canada club and Alberta clubs coming in and becoming part of it. New York City clubs uh, joining and becoming part of it. And it has grown now to where we have uh, Rotary, uh, more than 120 Rotary clubs around the world that have been part of the program to date. 
So, and that all started right here at this club. So I think everybody ought to give yourselves a hand because. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, uh, and all this starts with, uh, like I say, with the on the empowerment side. When you're working in the villages, um, instead of walking in and saying, "Here's what we're going to do," <laughs> you walk in with with your uh, fellow Cambodian uh, team members, and you and you ask them what they what kind of programs and projects they want to implement in their village, and then you encourage them to put together project plans so they learn project planning and they learn how to run things over a two to three year period. This is literally the photo you're seeing here is literally a, a you know one of the early village development meetings. This is the way they take place. They're outside. You have a lot of village women involved, a lot of the a lot of the the wives. So the underpinnings of the of the program are are well uh, wells for clean water. So on the well side, and I'm just going to run some numbers as we go through this, we've had more than um, uh, about 230 wells that have been installed as part of the project. Uh, Biosand filters, these provide water for the individual families and for the schools. Um, and we've had more than 2,500, more than 2,500 of these biosand filters have been put in. Uh, these things work entirely with local materials. They're built right there on site, so you don't have to bring in plastic and the like from outside. Uh, these large rooftop rainwater harvesting tanks that you see here, we build those right on site in Cambodia as well. Uh, we've had almost 450 of those that have been installed, and they're put in many of the community, well, uh, community schools and preschools. We have an animal pass-on program, which did come from Heifer International. So everything from chickens and pigs to cows uh, wind up being, and water buffalo wind up being part of the pass-on program. And that empowers the families. Uh, the, the families are actively involved in every one of these projects in the program, and, and especially in the animal pass-on. They create self-help groups, three or four to five families. They pass the progeny of the animals on to other family members in, in and other, in others in their group. And then each village actually winds up helping another surrounding village when this thing expands. Um, uh, agriculture is the underpinning of the income part of this. The families have to be able to make enough money to keep their kids in school. And, and so agriculture is a really big component of it. They do sweet potato, they do corn, they do all sorts of alternative crops they can take to market and make significant money from it. Um, so the empowerment model that we have really has these two sides, uh, two levels to it. One is the community development that I've been talking mostly about, which is the water, the sanitation, the income generation. And then the other side is education. For long term, to actually make a generational change in a country, you've got to be able to have the kids make a difference. And that's where the, the very first village development committee we had in the very first village in which we worked the the fam the the mothers in the in the village surprised us. We thought they were going to say priority number one is latrines or water or what or something. Priority number one for them was to get a preschool so that they could actually work during the day and keep their work in the in the fields and keep their kids safe and have their kids get an education. So that started the preschool program, and we've had numerous numerous uh, preschools in most of the villages in which we work since we started. There's a hot meal program as part of that. So the kids, um, uh, the, some of the mothers get together and create a hot meal for the kids during the, the preschool uh, part. Uh, those lead into community schools. Uh, the community schools do um, uh, help the kids get ready to go to further into grade school. So they might go halfway up through uh, elementary school. Um, we have, uh, you know, in, and in those schools, this is a great photo of one of them. This is just representative of what they look like and a lot of enthusiasm from the kids for what they're learning. And they, they also learn expanded stuff in health and nutrition, what foods are really good for them, um, the importance of sanitation. They understand they get some you know, underpinnings in science and how that works. Um, they, they, we have these libraries in every one of our schools and the libraries are just astonishing places. The kids really get involved in, in the libraries. And, and these lead to, the community schools lead to our enrichment schools. And in our enrichment schools, I think in, including all of them around all the different areas we have, and Susan will probably correct me on the numbers at some point, but I think we have six, seven, eight, uh, nine, nine schools, I think now, that are do go up through grade 12. And this is uh, 
you know, just one of those nine schools. So a lot of kids going to school as part of this program. In that, they get exposure to computers. Um, they get, uh, uh, we have dormitories for the girls to be able to spend time in uh, when they're too far from their village to be able to come on a daily basis and they'll go home over the weekend. Uh, we have youth clubs, which are based on rotary in each of these clubs. These, ro these uh, youth clubs are really fantastic. You just got to experience it on one of our trips some days. Uh, the, uh, they have rotating membership based on rotary. They do all the service and community projects. And then we have a scholarship program for these kids when they graduate from these little rural schools, they get to go to Cambodian University. So we've had, um, and, and I believe the number is around 450 kids that have gone through the university program or are a part of it today, um, and including about, I think, 350 so far that have actually graduated and, and gone on. So this is amazing. I mean, coming from, you know, from a village where you had no water, no running water, no electricity, you know, and, and, and getting a chance to go to school and then wind up going to university. And, and what, I don't think I have a slide on this, but what's incredibly cool is that of our team, our Cambodian team, because you have to have a big Cambodian team that's part of this process, they're the only folks that are paid, only Cambodians, everybody international is a volunteer in this. The, uh, of those Cambodians, more than half of them are graduated uh, kids who started as little kids with us, grew up, went to university, and have come back and are now part of the program and running the program. And, and, and that's really, you know, what we think is the long-term sustainable uh, change for, uh, for a country like this. The, uh, uh, so we like, I love this slide. This is another one of those photos that Elena took. It's just beautiful. But generational change starts, starts there with the kids, goes through the preschool programs, uh, the health and nutrition that they, that they get and that they learn up through the community schools, uh, through the, uh, uh, all the stuff that they get to do with computers and the like, um, the science education they get. We've taken over microscopes for them. Uh, they, they just become these incredible young people as they grow. Uh, the, the young girls, we, we have uh, more than 50% of all of our students are, are girls and, and, and young women. So we really have a big emphasis on that. Um, and the youth clubs get this sustaining leadership that allows them to come back and do great things. 16 is probably actually 17 generations by now of these university scholars. Uh, and uh, we empower women as part of this program. We empower families as part of this program, empower the young people as part of it. And honestly, we're empowering all the Rotarians that are part of this because that's, you know, at, at the end of our lives, this is what matters is giving back and making the world a better place. And uh, it, th this is uh, just a representative shot of one of our trips. We have trips coming up in January and February. Uh, be, we'll be leading 56 Rotarians from around the world in January, and then another 36 in February uh, as we go through the programs and the projects and meet all these kids and get out into the villages and meet the families. And um, so with that, I'm going to invite Elena and Susan to come up here quickly and just be with me for the last five or 10 minutes as we talk a little bit about uh, wrapping up on this. That's a big thank you. 